good. Once again, everybody, thank you for joining us for our fourth Wellness Wednesday. Um, we're so happy that we're having these and people are coming in just to learn a little bit more about taking care of themselves. And that's really what it is for us. The whole project is called Making Wellness a Priority. So how do we do that? Well, we find different ways. Leslie has been absolutely amazing. I keep talking to my coworkers about some of the sessions that she's done for us, the information that she shared. They're going to our, our uh, YouTube channel and they're watching the videos there. Um, it's been amazing. And tonight, unfortunately, just for now, for the short term, uh, this evening we'll, we'll wrap up three sessions uh, with Leslie. And tonight I'm really anxious thinking a little deeper about nourishing mental health. So we're looking at nutritional deficiencies and common ailments. I'm really looking forward to tonight's conversa conversation and having more information to share and to talk about. So Leslie, I'll hand it over to you um, and we'll go ahead and get started. Perfect, thank you very much, Denise. It's a pleasure to be back again. I know we got lots of good feedback at the other two sessions that we had together. So um, we're gonna do a little bit of the review at the beginning to sort of recap some of the things we talked about before because they do really are the yes. basics for nourishing your mental health, but then get a little bit deeper into some of the specific things that I like to do for some people that come to see me with specific issues, whether it be with happiness levels or sleep levels or, attention and learning or anxiety or things like that. So we'll go into that a little bit and uh, just share a little bit about what I have learned. So, um, so yes, yeah, so today for tonight's chat, just a little bit of a, a synopsis here about what we're gonna talk about. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how our body actually has some natural seasons and we are all a part of nature. Um, so we do follow some seasons when it comes to our health and wellness. Um, We'll talk a little bit about how nourishing shouldn't be stressful. We'll talk a, quite a bit, actually, about some sugar and artificial sweeteners and some of the things to watch out for that can affect our mental health. And I'll touch a little bit about how genetics and mental wellness come into play as well. Um, we're also going to touch a little bit on the effects of allergies and food sensitivities. It's surprising that things that can are supposed to be good for us may not all be uh, good for all of us. Um, then we're going to talk about something you guys may not have heard of before, something called adaptogens and some of the uh, pharmaceutical things found in nature. And then we'll get a little bit into a little deeper about things like depression and anxiety, uh, learning and so on. So I will get us going here. And of course, we do have our little chat button. So Denise is going to watch that for me and uh, happy to try to answer as much as we can in the way. So this is a bit of a review. So if you were with us on the other sessions, um, we talked a little bit about different foods and what our brain really needs. Our brain is not separate from our body. It needs the same type of nourishment that our body is really going to need. Um, the first one, and always my favorite, and sometimes the hardest to get for some people, is water. Um, it's good to soak that brain. Our brain itself is 75% water. And I found a statistic that even 2% of dehydration can have a negative effect on our brain function. So really, really important. So if we're getting to the point in the day when we got that little bit of headache right here, and we know we're dehydrated or we're, you know, the tongue's, tongue's, the tongue's feeling a little bit thick or something, then that's definitely a sign that we need to get our water in. Um, we're going to talk about whole foods. Uh, not what I call Franken foods. <laughs> um, all those processed foods, I call them Franken foods. If it's made in a plant, it doesn't come from a plant probably, right? Um, so if it needs a label, it's probably processed and been altered somehow and may not be the healthiest for our brain. Our brain needs good, healthy fats. If you're eating fries and fried chicken and that's your diet, you're going to have a fried brain. Simple as that. You need to have some good, healthy fats. Um, if we were to take all of the water out of our brain, that dry tissue of our brain is 60% fat. So getting really good healthy fats in our diet, um, good omega-3s and omega-6s and from supplements if we need it, um, is very, very important to our mental health. Uh, we talked previous to about the importance of protein. Uh, we need a full complement of all of the very building blocks of proteins, which are amino acids, um, and we can only get them from our food. Um, 
those are a lot of the building blocks of what we're going to talk about today when it comes to our neurotransmitters and different hormones that affect our brain health. So most important too for the brain as well as the body is to keep our blood sugars balanced as much as we can. There's so much research coming out right now that blood sugar imbalance affects so many diseases, cardiovascular disease, of course, diabetes, um, dementia, all sorts of things are really coming back to having blood sugars that are balanced and even throughout the day. So that's really the key to fueling our brain and helping avoid future problems too. So just a little bit about how our bodies have this natural wisdom. Um, and I've pulled some of this out from one of my traditional Ayurvedic um, Eastern uh, practices in terms of food and how they follow um, eating. Um, now with technology and transport and everything, we can get pretty much any type of food we want anytime we want. So if we wanna have uh, strawberries and pineapples and exotic fruits in the middle of winter, we can probably get them at our grocery store. They might cost us an arm and a leg, but we can get them. But traditionally, and the way that our bodies are made, they have certain nutrients, things that fuel them in the winter, that they're used to be able to get in the winter, and things that fuel them in the summer. And there is a pattern to that. So often following that or starting to recognize that will really fuel your body, your brain. So in the winter time, our bodies tend to be in what we call yin time. We talk about yin and yang, the opposite. So yin is very relaxing. It's very calm. Winter is the time that we slow down. We want to stoke that fire in our belly. We keep nice and warm. Um, our bodies are just not quite as active. Um, we're conserving energy right from the cold. And, and it's often, you know, we kind of do some deep thinking things too. We tend to be the school year, tends to be in the fall and winter as well. Um, so our body's craving like fire stoking food. So when you have that craving for comfort food, like chilies and stews and warm vegetables and things like that, that's, that's normal. And that's what the body needs in the winter time. So having things like proteins, like beefs and chickens, warm broths, um, even some of the spices like turmeric and garlic and cinnamon, um, mushrooms and, and warm teas and things. Those kind of really nourish your body in the winter. Now we'll be coming into spring. And of course, spring, we start to get things like fresh herbs and fresh salads starting. Um, and that's the time that the body actually has a little bit more energy. We're feeling a little lighter, more energetic. It's actually the time when the body naturally cleanses itself and it starts to rebuild and it starts to um, uh, rejuvenate and, 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 and grow just like the tulips and the daisies are going to grow, right? So things like the fresh sprouts and herbs, um, we get those seasonal fruits coming up like strawberry start and then it's blueberry season and apple season and those types of things and all of the fresh vegetables that we can get locally. And then, you know, we have more wild fish and it's fishing season or seafood. Um, and we feel we want a little bit lighter, refreshing fluids too, right? Um, we tend to actually have more raw foods in the summer too, because we want that lightness and freshness in our diet. So that serves a purpose. It doesn't just happen to be what is in season where we are. It actually serves a purpose and our body does look for that. And that's one of the traditional Ayurvedic things. So that can help feed your brain as well. So I want to bring that up today. Just kind of think about that as we go forward. So um, we talked a little bit the last session too that I know that when you're not feeling mentally well, um, you're anxious, you're stressed, um, you're depressed, sometimes we don't have the most motivation or energy or in the mood to put a lot of effort into changing our food up or even eating. Um, I totally get that. Um, some of the tips that I use is to take advantage of things like healthy meal boxes or you may have a local supplier that does pre-made meals. Um, Put things in the freezer, use your crock pots, make it easy on you, right? Um, try to cook as a family. That's a great way to do it together. Meal prep a little bit. It will reduce some of the stress about eating well. Um, always keeping some easy grab snacks for those hangry attacks when you happen to get them. Um, it's very easy to pick really sugary and not so healthy for us uh, treats when we're having a hangry moment. Um, always keep water as your sidekick. Um, and remember, if you make small changes, even 1% every day, that can add up to 365% a year. So it's consistent small changes can really add up. So instead of being really hard on yourself and changing everything at once, if you're not feeling mentally well or going through a period of anxiety, just little changes even can help out. And remember to enjoy food. Don't make this something that's going to be stressful on you too. I mean, joy, food is one of life's pleasures. It's our uh, social 
aspect to it too. And it's, and it's important, right? So we will chat a little bit about some diet foods and the downfalls and the stories that we get. Um, I didn't get a chance to talk about this before, but sometimes when we're making healthy choices, it can be um, confusing when we're going to the grocery store, about what to choose and what to pick and so on. So I want to clarify a little bit to tell you how um, some of these trends we see or the way that we market get marketed um, can affect our mental health. So advertising is always a trickster. Um, when we see something low fat, what happens is it may be lower in fat. However, it can often be very uh, high in sugar or added sugar or artificial sugars. So we want to be careful of that. Um, years ago, we got on this low fat trend. Um, and unfortunately, the rates of dementia and a lot of mental health disorders also went through the roof um, because of that um, or related to that. Um, there's also a low carb trend and so on. And low carb diets can be great for certain situations, for certain people at certain time periods if they're done well. However, um, often lower carb means that something will be sweetened with artificial sweeteners or there may even have some unhealthy fats in it. So we have to be careful of those too. Um, natural, the word natural is interesting. So there is some regulations in Canada, of course, around using the word organic. That has to be regulated and certified and it is a process. Even non-GMO is a process around that and a certification. The world natural has absolutely no government regulation at all. I can say that this plastic, beautiful pen is natural. There's nothing to tell me that I can say that this is advertised as natural. So natural really doesn't mean anything. It's just a marketing scheme. It doesn't have any valid government certification rules at all. So really be careful of that sometimes. That's a full one. Um, now, this one here also gets some people riled up because they're not sure what to do. They like their diet soda. They like their gum, their sugar-free gum, their low sugar yogurts, things like that but they have sweeteners. So sweeteners can be very confusing. Sweeteners have been uh, on the market for a while. There have been some sweeteners taken off. There have been some that have sneakily changed their name to something else when they get a bad rap. So things like aspartame or sucralose or saccharin, the splendas and the equals, all these types of things. These are what they do is when they get into our system, they will give our stomach and our brain the signal that sugar is coming. So what happens when the brain says, oh, I have some sugar coming, that means that I can do all of these metabolic things that I've been holding off on doing because now I have some energy to do it. And they will start doing it. So they'll start doing cleanups and makeups and things like that. But what happens is when that food gets processed, those aspartames and things like that, some of it will go into our bloodstream and they'll go into our circulation and some of them are very toxic. Um, some of it will just go and get eliminated. So the brain doesn't get the sugar it was expecting. So what does it do? It crashes. And then it sends out more cravings for more sugar. <laughs> so it gives us a false sense of our body needing what we want. Um, and a lot of these will actually are able um, as a toxin, as a chemical, to cross a little barrier that we have that's very important between our uh, blood system, our circulation system, which goes all around the body and the brain. It's called the blood-brain barrier. The brain is very, very sensitive and only certain things are allowed over there. However, there are some chemicals and some medications that can cross into the brain and affect it. Um, some of these sweeteners can do that. And they're actually what we call a neurotoxin and they tend to excite the brain too much. So if you're someone that's maybe prone to anxiety or nervousness and you have a diet of a lot of these artificial sweeteners, you may be making the anxiety worse. It's exciting those transmitters too much. There is also some um, research as well that they are, some of them carcinogenic. However, um, in the amounts that get studied, those particular amounts are not deemed as being harmful. When we have those amounts on a regular basis over and over and over, over a long term, they could be problematic. And that is the problem with research now is that we don't often study the long term accumulated of effects over time. 
for some of these things that are chemicals. So we have to be careful of those. Now, I am just gonna move my little, there we go, perfect. Now, so I have a little screen here. These are all the different names for sugar. So we talked about sugar and balancing your sugar last week or last month. Um, so I want to give you guys kind of a slide of all the different things that's, that sugar can be disguised as. Some of them you might not realize, the dectose and the maltose and the lactose and the malodextrin and things like that. Those are all different types of sugar. So when you're out buying sugar, buying things in the grocery store and that, you know, recognizing it on a package, that's the, and if it's, you know, one of the top, first three or four ingredients, it's probably got a pretty high sugar content. So you may want to make a different choice. So I thought I would add that in. And that list keeps growing. <laughs> so the other thing that has been really popular lately is kind of a replacement for those artificial sweeteners that we've heard about have been something called sugar alcohols. So what they do with the sugar alcohol, it's like an extracted form of sugar, of sweetener, from a real food, um, so something like corn husks, for example, and they will make an ext extraction of this. Um, and they usually extract it using an alcohol process. Um, so it gives the taste and the action of being a sweetener, but it doesn't do the same thing in the body as a whole plant would. Um, so like sorbitol, mannitol, erythritol, all these types of things, these are different names. What happens with these two is they will go into the body, um, they will still signal to the brain that some sugar is coming. Um, so we get that whole process of energy being expended. But what happens is that our body doesn't actually absorb these things into our bloodstream. So they just go to the digestive tract. Um, and in a lot of people, especially those that might have some Crohn's or some IBS and that type of thing, they can have a real laxative effect and they can really disrupt um, the balance of their gut bacteria. Um, so some people get really upset stomach and they know that they can't have them, but over a long term, they can really disrupt your balance of your gut bacteria. And the balance of your gut bacteria is really important for making some of your neurotransmitters because they play a big part in the neurotransmitters that, that talk to the brain and back and forth. So it's, it makes a big difference in your mental health. So you have to be cautious of them, use them sparingly. You know, if you're out one day and you feel like having a little treat of some yummy, you know, gummy bears that are a little bit better version that have some xylitol or sorbitol. Once in a while, it's not probably going to hurt you, but you know, it shouldn't be a regular replacement in your diet. One that I really like people to stay away with is high fructose corn syrup. So that one there you're going to find in a lot of cookies and treats. I know that I had a few older relatives and so on that Christmas time would come and they would go to the grocery store and get that good old corn syrup to make their peanut butter balls, <laughs> right? It's part of our lives. It's been part of our lives for a while, but more and more um, information is coming out about how harmful it can be long-term. Um, it's often now made from genetically modified corn, uh, which will not be indicated on the bottle because there's no regulament for uh, regulation for genetically modified things to be indicated. Um, it's highly refined. It's seen to promote obesity, inflammation, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, blood sugar imbalances, lots of different things. So that is one to avoid if you can. So let's see what we've got next. All right. So these are some of the other invent offenders that I have thing. So most of us would know that good old refined white sugar that we have on the market. Um, not all, but um, some of them now are now genetically modified. Um, and we won't know that because they're not regulated to be indicated that on the um, packaging. Um, I do know from the last time I researched that the brand Red Path is a good one. It's not genetically modified. Um, so if you do still need to have white sugar in your pantry for something, then that's a better option. Um, what they do with that sugar, it's been refined and processed. They actually use bleach to make it white. So it really doesn't have any nutrients left, right? You, as soon as you take it in, it's gonna spike your blood sugar and your insulin. Um, it's gonna make your cells less receptive to using glucose as fuel. It can affect your immune system and cancer risk and all those things. So it's one that's, you know, a tough one. <laughs> I know it's in so much and it's, it's something that a lot of people have used. A um, couple little substitutes that would be better. 
um, more of the fruit and plant-based sweeteners that have been derived from food are coming out like mauve fruits and stevias. Um, they're about 150 times sweeter than sugar. They don't spike the insulin like sugar does, but they are one of those ones, again, that doesn't actually get absorbed, goes right to our digestive tract for bacteria to feed on. So in some people that can cause discovery, and we don't really know long-term how much it will affect our gut microbiome, and it still gives the brain that fake signal that sugar's coming. So there is a little bit of evidence to things like uh, certain types of stevia that are not really well extracted can cause um, our neurotransmitters, serotonin and dopamine to be affected definitely. So the verdict is still kind of out on these, use them sparingly if you have to, um, you know, but uh, just keep that in mind. So um, one that uh, you may see too sometimes is one called Yacon syrup. That's a newer one. And it's um, actually from a sweet potato type looking of plant. So it has kind of a similar texture and taste to maple syrup, and it's not bad. It's a pretty good substitute if you have to make a substitute in a recipe. Um, if you absolutely have a recipe you want real sugar for, I would go with like an organic golden cane sugar. You don't have that bleaching effect. It still has the natural color and so on to it. Um, brown sugars, be careful with those as well. Some of them are just simply refined white sugar, and then they've gone back in and added a really low grade molasses to it. So it's not the best. So if you do want to do brown sugar, try to pick an organic one. At least it's been um, a little bit less refined than others. And these are some other real sweeteners that um, I think maybe you can try. You can find how to substitute them in most recipes. Bananas are a great one. I've made banana uh, nice cream, I call it. Um, it's actually no dairy at all. It's just bananas and other, other flavors. Unsweet apple sauce works really well. Dates can act, work well. Coconut sugar is better. Um, even raw honey or maple syrup, you need very, very little. Um, and I've seen some recipes even with dried fruits. Um, and you can get unsulfured black strap molasses on the market too. And that is actually really, really rich in iron and some other minerals. So that would be a better substitute too to try for some natural sweeteners. All to keep your blood sugar balanced in your brain working a little better. So I'm just gonna touch um, a little bit on genetics. Um, I know that we have been told in the past that our genetics we get from our parents, of course, kind of determines our health, what we're gonna get ill, what we're not, right? I know when I went to university, that was kind of the approach that genetics was years ago. And since then they have done so much more work in the genetic field. We now know that the genetics or the genes that we get from our parents make up only about 2% of our whole genes that we have in our body. So they're kind of figuring out what all of the other 98% does. So they found out um, that they actually do this 98% of genes that don't code for things that we got, you know, our eye color, hair color, things like that. They actually uh, work in a very interesting way called epigenetics. So epigenetics is this newer branch of science that basically investigates all of the factors outside of our inherited genetics that influence our predisposition for health. So it's literally the science of what turns our genes on and turns them off. So we may have gotten a genetic predisposition to certain mental wellness or even Alzheimer's or dementia or diabetes and things like that. But there is some other genes that whether they are turned on or turned off will help determine whether we go down that pathway of developing a disease or not. And there are several things that influence that. Um, stress is a big thing. Um, illnesses, how much we exercise can influence that. But nutrition is a very big one as well. So also things like sleep, all those types of things. So when we look at mental illness, as well as other illnesses, they're really influenced by that kind of an environment and whether or not certain genes we have will get turned on or turned off and we can change them throughout our lifestyle. So it's kind of an interesting concept. There's so much research being done to it, but it's just really comforting to know too that we do still have an influence on what happens, right? We're not genetically predestined to be a certain way. Um, used to say, well, my parents had it, so I'm going to have it. That's not necessarily the case. You can make a difference in your life. And I like to influence with food in that way. So 
resilience, learning coping skills, exercise, therapy, sleep habits, nutrition, all those types of things can influence whether we have certain genes that predispose us and whether they'll get turned on and turned off. It's very interesting if anybody's done their um, uh, family history or genetic testing too, they can actually tell you now whether or not you have certain predispositions. And there are even nutrition practitioners practitioners here in the world, I know we have one here in Moncton, actually a naturopathic doctor that will look at that raw data from your genetic test and say, you're predisposed to this, this, and this, or you don't um, use this type of vitamin well, or this nutrient well, or something. So this is how we can help you do it better. So very, very interesting stuff. So um, when we talk about foods and our brain too, um, we are all biochemically different. We are all individuals. We all need different things. We all process things differently. We even process things and need things differently from when we're a child to when we're an adult, if we're going through different life stages. So um, even the healthiest foods for some can cause brain fog, inflammation, fatigue, irritability, other cognitive concerns. Um, dairy and gluten is a common one. Um, but there are some other ones. For some people, it's nuts. Some people, it's eggs. Some people, it's foods that are high in something we call histamines. Um, others, they could be prone to something called salicates. Um, so there's all different varieties of foods that you know may cause us some problems. And when we say may cause us some problems, it might not be an allergy or sensitivity that you break out in hives right away or you um, get stomach upset or diarrhea or anything. It could be that if you're consuming something regularly, you may only have um, a symptom like brain fog or fatigue or low mood or irritability two or three days later right? Because it's causing some inflammation somewhere. So if you decide to change your diet or introducing things in your diet, or just want to look at your diet now, I always recommend keep a little bit of a diary of how you feel and what you eat. And you may notice some patterns that, oh, I had dairy three days ago for like a whole bunch of meals, and now I'm not feeling good. You know, you might notice a pattern. And maybe if you do notice a pattern, try removing that food for three to four weeks, reintroducing it, see if it changes anything for you. Um, if something is good for you, doesn't agree with you, it could be that you have a sensitive green allergy to that food. Um, so one popular food elimination program that I want to note that has been especially used for cognitive health and especially for children in terms of ADHD and ADD, but it's not specific to that, is something called the Fine Gold Program. So if you look that up online, you can see lots of information that, but they basically do use that elimination process to try to identify what uh, might be bothering you. I think. All right, well, we're gonna get into the um, little specialty ones for mental health here. And this might be one that's a little different. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of adaptogens before. So these here are adaptogens are herbs, plants, or mushrooms that actually help the body to maintain balance or be resilient to stress, okay? They have been used in traditional Eastern amenity for years as what we call a tonic for the body. They could be in the forms of teas or tinctures or foods or for wellness, but you can also get them as supplements. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some supplements for specific um, indications here as well. Now, it's very important when you look for supplements to make sure that they are approved by Health Canada. They all would have a natural product number on them, which means that they've been evaluated for their therapies and a therapeutic dose. Um, I would be very careful about ordering online from someone like Amazon in the US and other places, because in the US, they are not regulated to such strict standards as we have in Canada or in the same way. Um, and of course, always consult a health practitioner, um, because some can still have effects on medications or other disorders or might not be appropriate for you. So always keep that in mind, even though it's natural, it might have an interaction and not be right for you. So some of the adaptogens that I love, and I have some examples here, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that might be helpful. My absolute favorite one is ashwagandha. So ashwagandha also goes by the name of winter cherry. 
Um, it is a herb that helps to reduce our cortisol, which is our stress hormone. Um, it can help with insomnia. It's very calming and relaxing, but it's not sleepy. So it is a good overall, I call that, this has been, ashwagandha has been my COVID-19 companion. <laughs> um, it's just a very nice stress balancer. Um, it has very good, um, it can, it can work probably within about six weeks for a lot of people. It's not one that you take and that will work right away. Any of these adaptogens are what your body needs to help adapt over time. So it helps regulate over time. So it's a very nice one. Um, another one that's often in different formulas for mood and for health and memory are ginsengs. There are several different types of ginsengs available as well, and they all have different uses depending. They could be anywhere from anti-inflammatory. Um, they can improve male sexual drive. It can reduce stress. It can help with diabetes. It can boost your energy. They have sharper cognitive function. All sorts of really interesting ginsengs out there. Rhodiola is another one. Um, it is an herb that is something called an anti-anxiolytic. So anxiolytic, you might notice, comes a little bit from the very, um, anxiety. So it's an anti-anxiety type of uh, an herb. Um, it can be antidepressive and anti-fatigue as well. This particular one, you will find it often in different stress formulas, but it's often in formulas too in small amounts for um, women through menopause with other herbs and, and things that will adjust the, the hormone process of menopause because our hormones really talk to each other and they're very much interactive. So cortisol, which is our stress hormone, um, but also like vitamin D and then our hormones for mood, like our serotonin and our melatonin and our things like that interact quite a bit with our um, progesterone and progesterone and testosterone and sex hormones too. So they all really interact quite a bit. Even the thyroid is all affected too. So those can, you know, work together. So rhodiola is one that is not for everyone, but you will see it in some stress formulas and some formulas for menopause. Um, one warning I do have for rhodiola, if someone has any type of bipolar disorder, they should avoid rhodiola because they can affect those manic episodes too much. So that is one definite warning that I do have about that. Um, holy basil. Holy basil is an interesting herb. It is actually a type of basil. Um, I have actually bought holy basil seed here in Moncton and grown holy basil in my garden. Um, it does not taste the same as the basil that you put on your pizza. It tastes a little different, but I do have some and I've plucked it and dried it and I use it as a tea now and then. Um, it can also go by the name of Tulsi. So it can be very mood lifting as well. It can help with blood pressure um, in a supplement form. It's been used for high cholesterol and blood sugar balance as well. Um, but as a tea, it's very nice. It wouldn't be quite as concentrated as a tea. And it's a nice, very soft, soothing, calming afternoon tea, um, caffeine free and so on. So that's a very um, a nice one as well. Maca root. So maca root's an interesting one. It's a root that often comes from Peru. You find it in a powder um, and it's very commonly used for libido. Um, energy, it can be used in menopause mood support because it balances out some estrogen, progesterone and those types of things. And it's an overall antioxidant. So um, oxidative stress is something our body has just from its general everyday workings that it does. Um, and uh, antioxidants help sort of repair the damage from our everyday stress. So I call it an anti antioxidants or, or anti rust vitamins. They keep our, our body from getting too rusty from all the things that it has to do. So maca root's a, an interesting one too. Um, maca root, you can usually get it in a powdered form. And some people too will even just take a little bit, like a quarter teaspoon, and I put it in a smoothie with oat milk and uh, a banana, and it has almost like kind of a nutty taste. You know, add a little bit of cinnamon and it makes it, it's quite tasty. Um, Shazandra. So Shazandra is actually a berry. Um, it will help with some increased energies. It can give them some menopause support and it can improve vitality too. So these are just a very general, some of the herbs and supplements that you might see or wonder if you're in a, a food store or, or read something um, that can be used in different combinations or, or on their own to help with the body's adapting to stress or low level anxiety or low level mood things and things like that. But like I said too, 
you just make sure that if you're doing any medications of any kind, whether they be mood medications or thyroids or heart medications or whatever it might be, just to check with a professional to make sure that there's no interactions there because some of them will interact because they're doing the same thing that those medications might or they might have something like that. All right, I think we're pretty good for questions or anything right now. And the next one, so this is a fun one. Um, mushrooms, mushrooms have gotten very, very popular lately. Um, I know working at Sequoia, we put up a billboard during the year about uh, nature's medicinal mushrooms. Well, that was the most popular billboard we'd had. We've got more phone calls, people wanting all the magic mushrooms. So, well, they might do some magic, but they're not quite magic mushrooms, they're more medicinal. <laughs> so, but it was nice to be able to teach people about what you can um, use mushrooms for. So um, I noted a little note, if any of you have Netflix, there's a really interesting documentary on there called Fantastic Fungi. Um, so it talks about mushrooms and how they are sort of the nervous system of the nature of, of the forest, because they kind of, um, you see them above ground, but underneath they have these mycelium that travel miles and miles and miles. And they're almost like the nervous communication system for the forest. Um, it's interesting because there are some mushrooms can actually detect in their area if there is a disease or something that might affect a tree locally in the area. And they can actually send signals through the ground up to three to four um, or longer kilometers outwards to basically warn other trees in the area that there is this type of a disease in the ground. And those trees can start making chemicals to protect themselves against them. So that's just an, one example of what they can do. It's really quite amazing. So that's a really interesting um, um, episode and documentary if you're interested in that kind of nature stuff from them on Netflix. So even though these are natural as well, um, they can interact with medication. So be careful. Um, I would hesitate to go out in the forest to pick mushrooms unless you are very well educated in them as well. That's not something that I will do. And though I'm starting to recognize what some of them look like in nature, I still don't trust myself enough to go and pick any. Um, if you're looking at mushrooms for a really medicinal purpose and you want the really good health benefits, um, look for supplements that use hot water extraction. So mushrooms have a natural coating that is very um, hard to break down in the plant called a, a, a chitin or a chitin. So in order to get the medicinal part of the mushrooms out, they have to be hot water extracted. So that's very important. Sometimes you will find mushrooms on the market that are just simply dried out and made into powder. You don't get the same uh, value from them. So mushrooms have properties that we call immunomodulating. So they modulate our immune system. And part of our immune system is our stress response, which affects our mental health. Um, so they protect the body from the detrimental effects like stress, infections, aging, and things like that. So a lot of this research too, of course, comes from China, comes from Japan, and we didn't really know all of the health benefits for them because no one had maybe taken the time to translate all of these hundreds of research studies that were in that language to English. So we didn't know. So that's something that's being done more and we're learning a lot more. So I have a few examples actually here too, but we're going to talk about them. Um, lion's mane. Lion's mane is one that's used very much for cognitive health, focus, uh, brain health. Um, I have clients that are taking it after concussion and a brain injury. It's very protective against uh, cognitive decline as well. If I go back a screen here, two screens, this is what lion's mane looks like. So it actually looks like the big furry ruff that you would have on a male lion. So that's what that looks like there. Kind of interesting. Um, cordyceps. So cordyceps is an interesting mushroom. It is a true parasitic type of a mushroom. I will not tell anybody to go Google what cordyceps mushrooms look like and how they grow on living things because I will lose half of you from this presentation. <laughs> However, um, cordyceps is very good for energy production. Um, it really helps our mitochondria, which is the little energy powerhouses in our cells, make more energy. So it's very good at reducing fatigue. 
That's a wonderful one. So if you're looking to add a mushroom maybe to your morning tea or you're trying to go to a decaf tea, but you still need a little bit of energy, cordyceps powder would be a really nice one to add into it in the morning to give you that little boost of energy you need. Most of us in the Maritimes would probably have heard or know about shaga. Shaga is one that kind of looks like a really kind of a rusty brown, dark black lump um, that you might see growing on birch trees. We do have a fair amount of it in Atlantic Canada. So it's very much used for immune building purposes. So it's often used in, in immune building and stress relief in that way. Um, reishi is one that promotes relaxation. Um, it's very calming and soothing. It's great at bedtime. Um, it has some anxiety relieving properties and some sleep report. I actually have some dried reishi slices that I got um, from a company here. So they come in a little package like that. And the whole mushroom itself can be huge. So this is kind of just a dried slice, but I have a slice here. It actually looks a little different. It's almost like got this cardboard sort of feel when it's dried. But the way I use this one is I actually um, will boil it or so in some water and make a tonic out of it, leave it in there and steep for quite a while. And I make a tonic of it, just keep it in my fridge. And then what I will do is I'll add a little bit of that tonic to my regular tea or coffee or something throughout the week to, to have some of that. So um, the other one that I'm gonna talk about is turkey tail. So turkey tail is one that's kind of an anti-inflammatory one. You'll see it a lot to help with supporting digestion in your gut health too. Of course, we support gut health and digestion and anti-inflammation that can help our brain health too. So those are some uh, little examples of um, mushrooms. And I do have a couple of supplements here. I have the ashwagandha. If you can see that there's so many good ones on there, but there's ashwagandha is a good one. And this is one of my favorite products. If you kind of want to give mushrooms a try in your, um, your everyday, um, routine. Um, this is a favorite. It's called Harmonic Arts, which is a lovely company that started out in BC and, um, they grow their mushrooms, um, in a controlled environment. Um, and it's an elixir brand. So it's actually a five, it's a hot chocolate. So it has pure cocoa in it, some coconut sugar, but it has a blend of five different mushrooms. Um, and it has in it, um, well, let's see, it has shaga, cordyceps, lions, mane, reishi, and turkey tail. So all those ones that we talked about today. So it's really kind of good. I just do it with some almond milk or some hot, hot nut milk of some kind. Sometimes I'll put a little bit of coconut oil in it. Um, and I froth it up and it's a really good one. And you get a little bit of benefits in your daily support from that, uh, from all of them. So Harmonic Arts makes some lovely products and they have some nice tinctures. And I really trust them in terms of the mushrooms that they make and so on. So if it's something um, you'll find too on the market, there's lots of little mushroom coffees and little things and little single serve ones out there now too. It's kind of become a, a real new trend. So very interesting. All right, we are gonna dive deep a little bit now into some specific ailments and issues. Um, Denise and I were actually talking a little bit about how the seasons affect us around this time of the year and how depression of course is, is something that we see prevalent in our society too. Um, and about how, you know, just our general level of happiness and mood and, and good spirits. Um, so that's affected by our neurotransmitter called neuroserotonin. Um, and if we have impaired serotonin, we can often have like a low mood, a loss of pressure in different activities, maybe a lack of enthusiasm for people that we generally like to be around, um, our activities and just life in general. And for some of us too, we may also be getting like not a really restful deep sleep as well. So serotonin, in order to make serotonin in our body, we need a few things. We need exposure to sunlight. Okay, so it depends on that. Um, there is a trigger in our brain for our body to make serotonin that is dependent on sunlight. Um, we need the right level of estrogen. So menopausal women that tend to have estrogen really dip really quickly also tend to find that they have problems with their mood after menopause sometimes because their estrogen levels are low, it can affect their serotonin. So they're tied in very closely together. So serotonin, one of the main things it's made to from is a protein amino acid called tryptophan. So we need to get this tryptophan from our 
protein in our diet. So if we don't have enough protein, we may not have enough of that precursor to make the, the serotonin that we need. And then we also need the other nutrients that serotonin needs to become serotonin or tryptophan needs to make serotonin. We also have to get those things in from our diet, but then we have to transport them to the brain to make serotonin, right? Um, and that requires a few things. It requires certain nutrients, but it also works only if our blood sugar is good and balanced. If we have insulin that's crazy all over the place, we won't be able to get those nutrients across that barrier of the brain well to make the serotonin. So that's why we may find that people that have diabetic uh, problems or recently diagnosed with diabetes often have some mood problems too, or some decline in their mood. Um, so these would apply, you know, it's the case, the same seasonal affective um, depression or regular depression as well, kind of needs these, these types of things. So uh, how can we help it? Well, if we get some sun safe exposure, about 15 to 20 minutes minimum a day, preferably between the time of 10 and two. And there is a reason for that because the sun's rays come down at a certain angle and they will hit our skin at a certain angle and they will prompt our skin to make vitamin D. If we are wearing sun greens, that is going to block that. Um, we were talking earlier too about, you know, some people it's great to use artificial light therapy in the winter um, to help with that as well. Um, especially now that some of us are working from home, we are at home, we only need to go out to the grocery store and we're sort of in that same environment all the time that can maybe helpful, you know, so light therapy can be helpful as well. And you can access those uh, at a much lower cost than they once used to be, whether it be light bulbs or the actual box lights that you get. Um, I've even seen cases that will give light around your phone for that time of the day. Um, and I know that in Moncton area, at one point, even the local library was renting out the machines, so you could try them for a period of time too, to give that a try. So vitamin D supplementation, really important to our depression levels and serotonin as well. So anywhere's um, easily up to 2,500 international units, you can do that's the a, a Health Canada approval. Um, anything over that, I usually suggest people get their vitamin D tested because you don't want to take too much, but you can find the amount that's right for you. In order for us to actually convert serotonin in the body. We need a few other nutrients too. Um, we need iron. So for menstruating women, uh, or women with heavy periods or vegans, um, they may be deficient in iron. So have your physician watch your iron levels as well. Uh, magnesium um, and some of the B vitamins. So B3 and B12, folic acid, um, all of those are really important because they act as cofactors to making serotonin in the process of depression. So it's really needed. But it's kind of interesting too, that a lot of medications for depressions known as SSRIs or serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitors will actually deplete our vitamin levels or B vitamin levels. So I always recommend if somebody is taking an SSRI to take a, you know, a minimum B50 complex to some, some B vitamins, because you're going to get depleted in those. And, and depression is stressful and the stress vitamins are the B vitamins. So those are the ones that give you your energy and keep you going. So they're good to take B vitamins in the morning um, because they will give you some energy um, and that can help. So there. So serotonin is kind of interesting. So a lot of people don't realize the link between serotonin for keeping you happy during the day and melatonin that keeps you going to sleep well at night. So sleep is when our brain will actually repair itself. It helps integrate our memories and our emotions and whatever we've learned up during that day. And I also learned this week that the brain has a specific system called the glymphatic system. And it's something we've only discovered in about 2012. And it's basically the cleanup system in our brain. The thing is, it only works while we sleep. So um, if we're not getting good night's sleep or deep sleep, our brain's not getting cleaned up well. So that can seem or seems to be indicated and starting to play a role in dementia, um, you know, because it's that glymphatic system that cleans up all the extra proteins and things that make plaque that seems to be a problem for people that have Alzheimer's and so on. So it's an interesting thing to learn. So as we go about our day, the change from light to darkness, so even looking out of our windows, um, will trigger our brain 
to make melatonin after supper to help us relax and start bringing us into sleep mode. So melatonin like serotonin is made from the amino acid tryptophan. So as daylight goes down, generally our cortisol levels during the day will decrease. They're higher in the morning. Serotonin levels that keep us happy start to turn into melatonin and then the body gets ready for sleep. So if we're deficient in tryptophan, um, if we have too much light too late in the day, if we have too much cortisol in our body because we have too much stress during the day, all of those will affect our quality of our sleep, but they also affect the quality of mood during the day because we're not making enough melatonin to sleep well at night. We're not making enough serotonin to keep us happy during the day. So it's just an ongoing cycle that doesn't end well for any of us. So in the pathway of tryptophan turning into serotonin, melatonin, there is an intermediate called 5-HTP. Um, and you can get 5-HTP as a supplement. I actually have some here. Um, or you can get tryptophan as a supplement. So for some people that aren't taking medication for sleep or for um, depression, sometimes that medication can help um, that pathway of keeping your, your mood and your sleep regulated. So that's an, an option to, to investigate kind of thing. There. So these are some of the good serotonin foods to make sure that you have in your diet. Sorry about that. There we go. So anything from shrimp and eggs and snapper fish and halibut and turkey and chicken and lamb and beef. Those are the ones that I really, really like, good sources of overall protein. Um, but there's some vegan sources as well. So pineapple, mushrooms, um, spinach, spirulina. Spinach is a great one for iron too, as long as you steam it a little bit. So that spinach can, or that iron can be released. Um, sesame seeds, flax seeds, cashews, pistachios, almonds, those kind of things, all those good foods. So having a good different sources of protein in your diet is really important. Um, the eggs, especially, I love the eggs because they're just like the perfect protein. They have everything. And you think about it, they are a little bit like a brain, right? They're hard on the outside, soft on the inside, lots of good fats in them, as well as protein. Um, and think about the other one I didn't list here, but would be a very good one too, would be walnuts. And what does a walnut look like? It looks like a brain, right? Yes, there you go. Other thing too, if we're talking about the foods that sort of look like something, avocados kind of have that roundish look, very good fats for the brain too. So nature has an interesting way of making things look like um, the organs that are the systems that they affect in, our, in ourselves. So that's a little bit about seasonal depression and depression. Um, certainly not a comprehensive, there's lots of other things that might help, but those are the more popular ones. Um, now, staying chill, keeping that anxiety down. So we know that anxiety is so very common these days and affects many people, either on an everyday level or just circumstantial. We can have some anxiety and it can be anything from just everyday worry, not being able to turn the brain off to full on panic attacks, right? Um, so GABA is the neurotransmitter in our body that is the inhibitory factor to our nervous system. So it's the calming factor. So that keeps us calm versus others might keep us excited and focused and happy. So this keeps us calm. So GABA is interesting because it works not only in the brain, but it works other places in the body too. So we have receptors for GABA everywhere in the body. Um, if our GABA system is impaired, um, it can be some inner tension, excitability, restless mind, panic attacks, hard time turning off thoughts. Maybe we're disorganized with our attention span or worry excessively. Now, GABA itself can't cross into the brain. It's too big. So we have to send the precursors to GABA into the brain to be made, sort of like we have to do for serotonin. So glutamate, which is usually a byproduct of our regular sugar metabolism in the body or the way that our cells use glucose for energy actually can go into the brain and get converted to GABA. We also need to have B6. We need to have some good zinc. We need to have manganese and magnesium to do that. So if any of those are missing, our brain's not going to make it very well. Now, um, glutamate is a controversial one because some of you may have heard of monosodium glutamate or MSG. 
MSG is something that is often added to food, sometimes as a preservative or as a flavor thing. And it does still have some of that glutamate in it. So what happens if we do have um, our regular diet, our body's regularly making GABA, but we add in extra MSG from foods, what can happen is that glutamate can go into the brain to make GABA. But if we have too much GABA being made, the glutamate can cause a lot of excitation to the brain. So if we get a little bit of headache, we get a little bit of, of uh, you know, headaches and focus and irritability and anxiety too. So it's, it's a balance between too much and not enough. Um, but eating regular foods for natural sources um, and regular nutrients, your body's GABA should stay pretty balanced too. So you may hear sometimes, oh, it's really bad to kind of like, you know, stay away from anything glutamate. That's not always the case. There's just some that are really excitatory because they're using the food preservative industry, but the natural sources are, are very needed. So what foods will help with that? Um, green tea, green tea is a great one. It has L-theanine, actually helps affect GABA by calming it. Um, green tea is a good antioxidant. Beans, lentils, whole grains, potatoes, tomatoes, berries, seaweed. Um, so if you aren't taking any anti-anxiety medication as well, valerian root at bedtime, um, taurine or passion flower, you see those in a lot of seed formers. They will actually mimic the effects of GABA and calm the body. Reishi mushroom we talked about before works on that system as well. And GABA can be taken as a supplement and it can help with some effects of ADD too for focus. So it's very interesting. The other thing you can do, um, even if you are on medications for anti-anxiety, even some magnesium bisglycinate at bedtime can help relax the body too. So um, getting towards our last ones there. So staying focused and learning. Um, we're always excited to learn something new. We're excited about getting new pets, about trips, maybe someday, chocolate treats, lottery wins, you know. When we get excited, that's dopamine's job. So dopamine is our pleasure molecule in our brain. It's very important too for our emotional health and for our sense of motivation, our get up and go. So a lot of people, if they're suffering for depression, they may get that regulated through medication and things like that, but they still kind of feel like, eh, they don't have a whole lot of motivation. Sometimes that's called atypical depression or, or, or something. And, and it's the dopamine. They don't have that little bit of dopamine that keeps them motivated and focused. So if your dopamine is impaired, you can have poor motivation, decreased interest in sex. You might lose your temperature, temper easily, feel angry, aggressive when you get stressed. You might want to be a little bit more isolated. Um, you might kind of have an apathy for things that you used to enjoy. But unfortunately, we sometimes then turn to things that are not healthy to pump up our dopamine and get a little rush. So gambling, stress eating, shopping, checking Facebook, anything that gives you a little bit of reward or a little bit of pressure, uh, pleasure, that's your dopamine, right? A little bit of dopamine. And the thing is with dopamine, you get a little bit from something, it makes us want more and it makes us want more and it makes us want more. So it can have an addictive sense to it, to the bad things, right? Um, but um, if it's for better things, um, it can be very much effective and motivating and needed for learning. So some learning disorders and ADDV can have low dopamine as one of the factors that influence them. Um, so tyrosine is that amino acid that affects our dopamine. So it also needs to get to brain to be made. If your blood sugar is unbalanced, it has a really hard time getting there because it's a little bit bigger molecule. If our liver is working overtime to clean things up or clean a lot of toxins, the helper nutrients that need tyrosine can have a hard time too. So magnesium, B12, iron, B5, B6, folic acid, even oxygen are all needed for those motivation molecules. So when I say oxygen, um, iron would be a big part in that because iron carries oxygen through our blood to all parts of our body, but also exercise plays a part in that too. So just getting some exercise and getting your heart rate up will bring more oxygen to the brain that can help your focus and your motivation and your dopamine levels too. So um, I don't know if anybody knows what this little food is, but this is one of the good little dopamine substances that we can get. This is the cacao nut. So this is what we get cacao or dark chocolate from actually, um, or cocoa. So these have something, dark chocolate and cacao have something called phenylethylamine that is a precursor in the body to help make dopamine. So that's why we get a little bit of pleasure from the dark chocolates. 
right? Um, there's another herb called Mucana purians, and that's the herb that actually has some natural L dopamine. So if you ever went to a naturopathic doctor and you were doing a little bit of work for, for dopamine, that's often an herb that they would use. A little bit harder to get, and it's a little bit more expensive. So dopamine, you'll get it in good sources of protein, of course, like meats and eggs and cheeses, um, oats, um, and it's really helped a lot by extracts from blueberries, so including blueberries in your diet. Um, Brazil nuts will give you some selenium that works really well for dopamine. Um, there's something called N-acetylcysteine. Um, you may have heard of that in the news lately because it's a detoxifier. It's very good for your lungs and infections of the lungs, but it helps detoxify the liver and the brain too. And alpha lipoic acid, and that is something that often helps with blood sugar balance. So a lot of diabetics are often um, suggested to take alpha lipoic acid as well. So L-tyrosine, you can actually get it as a supplement as well, kind of thing. So it can help um, and so on. So I think one of the last ones we're almost done is our memory and our learning. So anything from regular learning, um, staying focused, learning throughout as we age, our cognitive health, learning deficiencies, disabilities, um, can often have a part to play with acetylcholine. So that's a neurotransmitter that affects turning our short-term memory. So whatever we might've learned today or remembered or experienced today into longer term knowledge. So this is the one we get concerned about in Alzheimer's and dementia. Cause a lot of Alzheimer's patients can recall um, events from farther, like long ago when they were a child or a certain age, they've got them imprinted in put into their memory, but they don't remember if they turned off the stove or they don't remember who visited them yesterday because that short-term to long-term part is not functioning like it should to anyway. So for acetylcholine, it's right in the world. Choline is one of the nutrients that we need. So choline is a type of a fat um, that we find, especially in eggs. Eggs is a wonderful source of it. Um, and it's needed and helped by B5 and acetyl L-carnitine, which is another part of protein that we get um, to really help work in the body. So lecithin is a really good source of choline as well. And you can get it either as a non-GMO soy supplement one or a sunflower lecithin or a liquid. I have a bottle of sunflower lecithin liquid and I just add a little bit to my smoothie. It doesn't have any taste to it or anything like that. And I really like to enjoy eggs too. So that can help with learning and memory. So very important. So here are some of the foods that you can get acetylcholine for. Um, you know, it, it's part of the protein too. So there. And of course, anybody that might have been on a low fat diet, they probably weren't eating a lot of egg yolks. They might not eat a lot of full fat dairy or nuts or things like that, right? So we're really seeing a big uptake in dementia and cognitive disorders and so on. Because that combined with un use of, or unbalanced blood sugar can really affect things. So if I still have your attention, um, attentiveness is not optimal for all of us. Um, another thing to add in that is that food colorings, preservatives and additives can really affect our attention and our focus, right? We can, uh, we know um, that there's been research on yellow dye number five, and red dye this and red dye that, and all those types of things that get added that can really affect our focus, especially in children. Um, and I don't really understand. I know that I picked up something, um, I think it was a gravel actually, just a few, a few years ago. And I, you know, and I was like, well, why does this have to have red dye in it? Why does it need to be pink? Can it just be gravel? You know, I don't need it to be pink. And that was unfortunate because that's a lot of those colorings and things are in medications, especially for kids and, and foods. So sensitivities to foods like dairy or gluten or eggs or even chocolate or others um, can bother our attention and our ability to learn and our activity or hyperactivity levels. Something called salicates for some people can cause attentions too. So salicates, if you look at on, online, you can find a list of them, but those would be things like um, plums and berries and um, grapes for some people, tomatoes, prunes. There's a certain class of food that has a lot of salicates um, and makes salicylic acid in the body that tend to be sensitive for some people. So sometimes that can cause some problems. 
So, um, and also caffeine and blood sugar spikes, right? Getting some sugar in you or getting some caffeine, it kind of gives you a false sense that you're focusing your attention, but really in the long term, you're not going to have as good attention as you might like. So the other thing um, that I think is really uh, needed too is magnesium. So that's a really good precursor to get that acetylcholine and your attention focus working really well. So I've summarized a little bit some of the things I like to call it our brain pantry um, that can help anybody. Um, you might have noticed that I've repeatedly said a lot of the B vitamins through our presentation. So a good methylated B complex and B vitamin foods. So these are the ones most depleted by stress medications and the most supportive of the brain um, can safely be pretty much taken by most people. An omega-3 and omega-6, getting a really good omega fatty foods and a supplement and really for brain and mental health. Um, they've been researched for adults, like up to three grams a day is really optimal. So you can, you know, there's, there's different levels. Um, there are some out there right now. Um, I know there's one called Omega Joy and there's one Omega ADHD, even different ones that are specifically formulated as per research exactly for brain health. Um, and you're still going to get the benefits for inflammation and cardiac and so on from that too. Iron rich foods, we got to get those nutrients in the brain and oxygen to the brain. Um, and then some of the little minerals like magnesium is very good for relaxing the body. Magnesium plays a part too in the nerve conduction of our, our nervous system. Trace minerals, um, choline, so sunflower, soy, lecithin, lots of good proteins, water. Always try to pick whole foods as opposed to packaged foods and so on. And there's something that's created is a little bit newer. Um, you may have heard of the DASH diet before. So that was one that's recommended often for those with heart disease to follow. Um, they've now created something called the MIND DASH diet. So it combines health, heart health, but also cognitive and mental health as well. Um, and it's really based on almost the Mediterranean style of eating. So that's a very good whole foods kind of approach at good long-term keeping your brain healthy, but also your heart healthy too. So, and then at the end, I've added a few references if anybody wants uh, any information, but that's what I have for you today. There's so much that we could get into with very specific things for, um, brain health, but I hope it's kind of giving you a little bit of an overview of what the options are out there. Um, yeah. Well, Leslie, this has been amazing. Once again, and, and I say that at the end of every session you do, it's been amazing. It's been so enlightening, so much information. Um, okay, a couple of things here. Uh, I really like this group, great. Uh, and Gabriella says, I would like your opinion about the soda stream water and this naturally flavored sparkling drink mix. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have not looked at the drink mixes themselves. I know the concept, you know, that you do your sparkling water and so on at home. A um, couple of things. So I would look at those because I haven't looked at them to see if they have natural, if they're really, remember I said natural, there's no rules against natural. So natural flavors could still be a natural flavor made in a lab, right? It may not necessarily be from fruits or something like that. So I'd have to look at those. So I would be a little wary of those. Um, in terms of sparkling water, it's a nice little treat to give you a little bit of fizz. It's not a replacement for water. The reason I say, when you add carbonation to something, um, carbonation is awfully done with some phosphorus and so on. So if you have carbonated drinks on a long time, over time in your body, it changes the balance of acidity in your body. Your body has a very narrow pH range it wants to maintain. And so it changes the level of acidity in your body. And in order to maintain the acidity at the right level, when you have a lot of carbonated drinks, what the body will actually do is it will pull calcium irons into the blood to buffer the acidity. So uh, carbonated drinks, pops, things like that, um, even too much fruit juice or too much, you know, things like that can cause the pH to be off a little bit. And over a long term, if you have that and you're continually pulling some calcium into the blood, guess where it comes from? It comes from the bones. 
So that can kind of have some long-term consequences on bone health. So that's my concern with fizzy water. Um, being that said, I have fizzy water myself now and then. Um, I haven't looked at those, you know, flavors, like you can get the Pepsi flavor and to put in your soda stream and things like that. Um, I'd have to look at the ingredients of that. Assuming you don't get as much sugar as you would a normal bottle of pop. Um, but that being said, fizzy water with something like uh, stevia sweetened um, fruit, little drops or something might be a better option or adding your own lemon or lime or, you know, infusing it with your own berries or something might be a better option. That's my opinion. Without Perfect. looking at the person. Yes. <laughs> Leslie, I'm, I'm listening to you name some of these things. You know, yes. for example, ginseng, holy basil, um, the different types of mushrooms that, you know, that kind of stuff. Often, obviously, I can't just go to my local drugstore and get that. So I'm going to a health food store or not. Like, what am I, what am, where am I going? You will find some things at your regular drugstore, you know, whether it be the Jameson okay. brand or something. Um, I don't know how much information you might get there about asking questions about it right. honestly maybe you'll get great information maybe not yeah. um definitely health food stores you know the one that i'm at others that we have locally in moncton that type of thing or through a naturopathic doctor they can really give you you know better information very important to let them know if you're taking other supplements or you have heart conditions or you have other um, medications and so on, because those can interact. You know, I know the thyroid medication will interact with a lot of them, um, but we do have access. I know I have myself have an access to a database that will monitor interactions between natural herbs and medications too. So yeah. And, and some, it takes a little while sometimes, especially when it comes to sleep to maybe find the right one for you. Um, so it's kind of a trial and error sometimes, but um, right. yeah. Now, if you're doing something like, for example, that little mushroom hot chocolate, you know, this would be a great thing to add in in the evening or later in the day instead of your last coffee. And that you can do it pretty safely, you know, unless you're on some really strong you know, um, mental health medications, but those things you can add in pretty safely because they're not a true therapeutic um, supplement type dose. It's more like a food, right. right? And it's regulated right. like a food, but other things absolutely you can go in and you can see. And some of the ginsengs and that, they might even be in a combination. You can find nice combinations that are for focus or for um, stress support or, or things like that too, kind of thing that are already I, I think after our three conversations or, or three sessions, I'm seeing that I think I would benefit from sitting down with you and getting some one-on-one -on -one counseling in the nutritional aspect and, you know, taking everything that I have and, and, you know, any symptoms or illnesses that I have, things that I've been diagnosed with. Uh, these are issues that I have. These are things that are, you know, like I talked to you about how tired I am lately Yep. having trouble yep. staying awake, you know, and things like that. And so I, I'm really thinking that I would definitely benefit from sitting down and, and I really listen to the value, the importance of certain foods and vitamins and nutrients and minerals. And we don't have that common knowledge. So I think, no. I think for people in general, just to want to get on the track of good health, I think it would be helpful to sit down with someone like yourself and get yeah. that direction, yeah. get that information, and, that insight. Yeah. And that's the way, I mean, definitely in my profession, the way that we look at it, we look at the body as a whole. So when we sit down with someone, we have questionnaires and you might look at some of the questions and think, what in the world is this? Like some of the questions are like, do you find your handwriting gets worse during the day? Or do you find we look at everything from like the little indications on your fingernails to there's a lot of different little signs and symptoms that the body will give you what imbalance is not happening. And so we really go pretty thorough. Um, and our focus is, first of all, we always work on the gut. We always work first on is your digestion working? Is your body processing, breaking down foods? Is it letting things in through your gut to your bloodstream and the rest of your body? It shouldn't, vice versa. Is that working well? Because you get that working well, then the other things start to come together. They all, this is the way that we nourish ourselves is through our digestive system. So if that's not working well, and we're not clearing out things we need, then the rest goes out of whack. So okay. we really try to get to a root cause more than just 
putting a Band-Aid on a symptom, right? We're not going to throw right. a salad on a symptom. We're going to get to the root cause. And, and the purpose is to do it with whole foods and lifestyle changes. And supplements are just that. They're supplements. But, you know, we'll go from yeah. there. Yeah. No, I definitely know that I need lifestyle changes. There's no question for that. And, and, and for longevity and just good overall health. Um, so, yeah, I'll be calling you. Yep. Elizabeth has a question about, I can't find certain foods at the grocery store. Do you have any suggestions where to buy better foods? Um, it depends on the foods, I guess. Um, so my suggestion is some grocery stores are better than others in terms of their natural and organic sections. Um, think about again, seasonally, right? Like if it's middle of the winter, as much as we would love to have strawberries and pineapples and all that, They've come a long way. They're probably not the freshest. They're really expensive and hard to find. If you absolutely need them, you can probably find a good frozen one, right? Frozen food, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but, you know, maybe then what I do, I find I used to eat strawberries all the time. It's very rare that I have a strawberry unless it's now strawberry season. When strawberry season comes, watch out. Like that's probably all I eat for weeks, right? Because I love them so much. I might freeze a little bit for the winter, but... I, you tend to just, if you eat a little more seasonally, you'll find foods that are a bit more local, sometimes a little bit more less expensive. Like right now we can still get carrots and potatoes and root vegetables to make soups and stews and that pretty easily, you know, in the Maritimes. There's lots of potatoes available as we know. So things like that. And then going into spring, we'll start to get fresh greens and stuff. And that's where I really like, um, like our local uh, food baskets or farm baskets too if you really want to try to eat and eat more vegetables if you subscribe to like a weekly food basket you get like a selection of seasonal weekly vegetables for one or two people or however many people in your family delivered to you you've got them there you use them you might find something new that you don't know how to use that you can look up and try so you have them you're going to use them right instead of maybe you might not necessarily be tempted to buy them at the grocery store but you've got them so that's a good way to kind of help with certain foods and help incorporate changes too. And you can do that even with meats. There's CSC things for meats and produce and chicken and all that kind of thing too. I find I do that a lot. Um, I don't really have to go to the grocery store very often, truthfully. There's a few things I go to, but most of it I get, you know, through a basket and then I'll get, you know, meat for the freezer for a certain period of time. So, yeah. Sounds awesome. Oh, some good stuff. Really good stuff. Okay, we're 815. Uh, just wondering if anybody, if there's a last question, uh, I did answer back. This was recorded or this is being recorded and will be available through our website, cmhanb.ca. So please uh, go ahead there, suggest it to friends, family uh, that they should really, and also catch uh, Leslie's previous two sessions because each session has kind of built on the one before and, and so much great information. So um, I think it's really important that we really uh, get to understand all of it and how it works. And, and I know it's way over me, but I think I'm gonna sit down with Leslie and say, okay, let's see what we can do for me and for my health. So I think it was really, really good. It was very, very interesting. Um, some great information, really good information about what we need to do, uh, what we need to eat and, and the kind of foods and everything else. So uh, yeah, there's Leslie's, uh, she's put in her information. Um, so she's in the Moncton area. Um, so, and. And maybe Leslie, I don't know if somebody's from St. John or from another, if you have uh, contacts in some of those areas where you might be able to yeah. suggest. Absolutely. So they could still reach out to you and see if maybe mm -hmm. you could recommend yeah. somebody in their yeah. own community. Absolutely. Yeah, so that would work. Yeah, right now I do pretty much most of my consultations. I do them on Zoom. Um, I'm at Sequoia Trinity part-time. So they are all me and all my colleagues are registered holistic nutritionists. I know there is a Sequoia that's uh, independently owned in the Fredericton area, but I've got lots of contacts and colleagues that I can kind of help you out and happy to Perfect. reach out. And they can follow me on Facebook at Leslie Baker Nutrition or Instagram. And I put my email address in there again for them. That's right. And, and, through and Zoom, you can give it out it to Denise. Matter where we are. <laughs> you can right. give it out too if they ask you, Denise. That's no problem. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And then, yes, like you said, with doing everything on Zoom right now, 
Um, so even if somebody's in St. John or up in mm -hmm. the North Shore, you could still be working with them. Exactly. You could do that through Zoom. So yeah, there you exactly. go. Exactly. Yep. So yeah. So the door's open, people. Sure is. Uh, get in line <laughs> behind me, though. <laughs> just, just kidding. So, okay, Leslie, once again, I can't thank you enough. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, such an educational experience spending these three sessions with you. We will do this again in the future uh, for sure. And then we'll talk about if there's any other stuff that we can do uh, in relation to our health, our mental health and physical health. I mean, we can wrap it all up because it, we need to look at health as whole health, right? Yeah. Rather yeah. than yeah. just physical or mental. Um, so yeah, so um, we'll do this again. That's great. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun, Denise. Loved it. <laughs> loved it too. We all really right. loved it too. And all, all the right. participants. Thanks for coming, everybody. Right. And Thank hopefully you. we'll see you at the next one. Okay. Bye for now. Have a good night.